A very special good evening to each and every one of you. My name is David Fry, and welcome to the Zaleski Brothers Film Festival. We have for you tonight three of the films produced by the Zaleski Brothers, and we have three of them here in the studio with us to discuss their films and how they got started. These films, by the way, I should mention, were shot on location around the Canton area approximately between 30 to 40 years ago. With us here in the studio to talk about their films are, as we said, three of the Zaleski Brothers, we have Len, Brother Len here. Mm -hmm. We also have Ed Zaleski and their brother Al Zaleski. Gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to have you all here. I didn't take time yeah. out of your busy schedules to be with us. How's, uh, how's everything going? Oh, just great. Just great, David. Let me just ask you this first. Uh, how did, as I understand it, the Zaleski brothers got started because Al, it's going to take me a while to get the brothers down straight. Al had a, a pension for horses. Is that not right? Oh, he said. I mean, and I was, I had the horses prior to go ahead leaving for the army, and uh, when I returned from the army, why uh, the Len and those were into uh, cameras, into film, and so forth, and so it naturally uh, evolved that we would, uh, and we were totally western orientated. Although we lived in town, on the edge of town. I mean, we'd, uh, uh, cowboys and all that were just our, our way of life. And we dreamed about it and uh, just, uh, constantly. And then uh, Len was actually the one that finally uh, started to put this thing together. But he was so enthusiastic, let's, uh, let's make a film and so forth. And uh, so actually, I'd uh, attribute our beginning, not uh, the fact that I had horses, I was into the horse business, but the fact that he had, uh, with the enthusiasm to, to do something about uh, uh, suddenly, you know, making film or uh, put it on uh, uh, record. So, so as they say, it's more of a case of you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boys. Mm. So it's so true. Oh, it is. And we want to uh, make a mention also, I understand there's seven of you all together. That's right. And who are the other four that we do not have with us today? Well, there's Stephen, Frank, and Dick, and Casmer. Okay. Or Kai. We'll Kai call, is Kai. Right. They, they call, call him Kai, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're glad to have the three of you here with us. And Len, uh, so you were enthusiastic about getting some of these antics on uh, on the film. Oh, yeah. I uh, My brother Kai owned a movie camera. And uh, we had all these horses and we had these uh, locations nearby that uh, had the look of the West. It happened to be a brickyard. <laughs> where the steam shovels had excavated and and uh, in their wake you know they had all kind of gulches and passes and rocks and and valleys and things and it just made an ideal setting for a, a western film and i was a movie going buff at the time wa watching the uh, films downtown you know at the time the old time Local westerns Bijou. and so forth right, right. <laughs> and uh I thought, gee, why don't we try making a movie? We've got a movie camera, you know, let's give Can't it a try. Hard, right? So everybody was enthusiastic and we just, you know, got a roll of film, loaded the camera up, got a few props, a couple horses, took them out and, and uh, we actually produced about 13 films. The, f the first four were uh, in eight millimeter. F uh, let's see, five of them were in eight millimeter and then the other eight were 16 millimeter. We switched to 16 millimeter one day when we saw the vast difference in the sharpness and quality of the film one day. And uh, from then on, we were we were sold on the 16 millimeter format. Actually, it would be twice as sharp then because oh, of yes. a larger size film. Before we go any further, we do have some uh, newspaper clippings. Uh, that depict some of your early successes uh, some 35, almost 40 years ago. And we want to take a look at those. Here, we, what, what exactly was this one, Len? It's a little hard to see. Well, actually, this has been laminated and doesn't show up very good, but it was a, uh, a write-up in the Canton Repository in 1948 following the 
news that we had won a national amateur filmmaking contest in the scenario division, that is the films that depict a plot uh, in a national contest. This, there you have it there. This here is a picture of me after I returned from the Navy several years following. I made three travelogues while I was in the Navy and showed them to various clubs and organizations following my return. I narrated, I narrated the films live in person with musical background. They were called Caribbean Holiday, European Holiday, and Mediterranean Holiday. So it's a, a trilogy of holidays. Right, and it was like uh, seeing the world through the eyes of an American sailor. Okay, let's talk very briefly about the first film that we're going to see today, which is Under the Sun. Right, Under the Sun was developed from an idea from a movie that I saw with Gregory Peck and Jennifer Jones made in 1947 uh, by Daryl Zanuck Studios. I've heard of him. And uh, I got the idea to make uh, a spin-off of that called Under the Sun. And the plot has to do with uh, gold and treachery. Let's leave it at that. Let's go now to Under the Sun, the first of our three features in our Lend, or excuse me, Zaleski Brothers Film Festival. <laughs> Like somebody's hurt. The poor fellow's dead. Maybe something will tell me who he is. Uh, here now, let's see. Why, this looks like a map. Hey, Kurt, looky there. Looks to 
me like he's found something, Bart. Yeah, let's keep an eye on him and see what he does next. This is a map to a gold mine. Maybe he has some of the gold on him. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Why there? Why? Look at them nuggets. There could be millions more just waiting. That old prospector hit pay dirt, Bart. Yeah, let's get him, Kurt. We'll split the take. Right. Huh? What did I do with the map? Gotta get back to town now. Here he comes. Hold it. Keep an eye on you. What do you want, mister? I ain't got nothing. We'll see about that. That's mine. That's what you think. You won't get away with this. All right, get moving. Huh, Kurt? You cut me out and get it off. Toss out your gun. Give me the map. I might have known. Come on, make it snappy.
And we are back here in our Zaleski Brothers Film Festival. You just witnessed the first of our three films over this hour-long film fest, and that was Under the Sun. Uh, filmed over a couple of uh, months, two months in the summer of 1948. And now Len Zaleski, he didn't have quite that big of a role in this, but I want to talk to your brother Ed here, who played the part of Bart, was it? Kurt. Kurt, I'm sorry. Outlaw Kurt. Outlaw Kurt. Ed, what was it like on the, uh, on the set of Under the Sun? Well, it was sort of a dream come true. Everybody who's a movie buff would like to be in movies, and everything came together with Al and the horses and Leo with his interest in filming, my brother with the camera. So I did, they did the hard work, the technical part. I had the fun part, acting, and uh, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And a uh, pretty elaborate fight scene in that film. Uh, how was that choreographing that scene? Well, we had to take our time with that and do segments of it. Just a mat, you just had to try to imagine a good fight and, and do it. Set the angles right so that it looked authentic and go at it <laughs> and be in good right. shape because we did some rolling around. But when you're 18, you can do those things. <laughs> and how old were, were you other brothers at that time? Roughly. Well, I believe I believe uh, you two Kat, younger than I, I, I believe uh, Kai, uh, who played Bart, was about uh, 24 at the time, and uh, Stephen was about 31. And you were telling me this was shot practically in the shadows of the Timken uh, roller bearing plant. Right. Uh, actually, we lived right near the city limits in southwestern Canton, Ohio. And we could actually, uh, we could see the Timken Company from the location where we were shooting under the sun. We had to be careful because uh, there were telephone poles and lines and, and smokestacks and things like that. Uh, but by a little, uh, little carefulness that way, we avoided showing those in, in the scenes. We, uh, we want to talk to our hat expert here, Al. Uh, Al, I understand that uh, there's something special about the black hat that was used in, uh, in Under the Sun. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it, uh, uh, our props were, were very uh, minimal. I mean, we uh, had to use whatever we could uh, uh, put together. And uh, the, it probably was more authentic because we used what was available, uh, not the modern Western clothes and so forth. And his hat was, had to be reshaped and reused for different scenes. So if you, if you, pass, if you so, see the black hat often, it's, <laughs> it's the same one. That's right. Uh, Kurt wore the hat in his part of it, and Clem, the prospector, <laughs> wore it in a redone-up shape. And then, uh, Len, I don't think you had a hat in your, your uh, cameo appearance as the dead prospector at the that's beginning right. of the film. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, uh, that, that was an easy role for you, I'll bet. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. It, it was well, our first major production in full color and uh, we, we were all excited about that and when we saw that there was the uh, home movies magazines uh, was sponsoring a national contest for amateur films uh, we decided to enter it and son of a gun if a couple months later we didn't get word that it won first place as the best scenario amateur film of the year and mm. we got all excited and uh, made big plans to continue our, our uh, filmmaking efforts, and we came up with a film we'll see a little later, which we consider our best, called Bold Bad Men. Okay, we want to say we have saved the best for last, but first we want to go to our next film, though, which is Screams in the Night. It's a mystery tale of haunted woods and, and just the kind of things that can happen in that type of a scenario. It stars Leonard Zaleski and Julius Gliba. 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 Yeah, uh, do, uh, we called him Deuce. That was his real name. Actually, in the film, we use our real names because it's a modern-day setting. About uh, It's about a legend of a woods that is supposed to be haunted, and it made for a good plot. I got the idea for this film from a move, movie I saw in 1947 called The Red House with Edward G. Robinson and Lon McAllister. And... Uh, I actually made the movie to fit the musical score from that film, which you will hear a lot of. Nicholas Rosa, the famous uh, Hollywood musical 
uh, uh, composer composed the uh, Academy Award winning score for that. And I like the plot line of the Red House, which uh, kind of ties in with Screams in the Night and then the music. It all blended in and we had the location, abandoned strip mine with an adjoining woods and we had a big time making that one. Well, a let's go right. Let's go on, go on right now to our second feature in our Zaleski Brothers Film Festival. Let's uh, go now to Screams in the Night. Yeah. And hang on to your seat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See. <laughs> See. Yeah. Let's right. go to it right now. <laughs> To look at them, you'll agree they're nothing out of the ordinary. But a legend says that Foxhead's woods are haunted at night. Horrifying tales have come forth from those who dare to enter of being chased out by unearthly noises, laughs, and screams. Well, some say it's the ghosts of settlers killed in an Indian massacre many years ago who now forbid their entry. You believe what you may. This story is about my friend Deuce. One night against the warnings of a mysterious stranger and his friends, dared to enter them. I happened to be with him that day, and this is what happened as he afterwards related it to me. It's about two months later now, and Deuce prepares to keep a date with his girlfriend, Tippy. The same girl he was romantically involved with at the time of the incident. But up to now, hadn't told her about it. Hello? Hi, but this was going to change. Maybe come over now. All right. Bye. said it reminded him of that terrifying experience he had one night in Foxhead's Woods. You went into Foxhead's Woods, she exclaimed. Well, she just had to hear all about it. So they sat down, got comfortable, and he related the tale. Tell me about it, Deuce. Well, it all started about two months ago. But we, Leo, and two of our buddies decided to go on a hike. Well, we all arrived in the area of Foxhead's Woods about 2 o'clock in the afternoon and began our hike in the strip mines that surrounded them. It was quite a place. A little later on, we come to the top of this big knoll, and everybody was wondering what's the best way to get to the bottom. What did I know? I'm going to jump. Of course, they thought I was batty, but... I showed him I wasn't fooling. Well, once I got to the bottom, they followed me hippity hop. Well, we kept on hiking, taking it all in and having a good time. 
A little while later, we came across some friends of ours who were taking the dip in the cool waters of the old strip mine pool. Well, that looked too good to pass up, and Deuce and I just happened to have our trunks along. But Jerry, Mike, and Junior forgot there, so they just had to sit and watch. Well, after we got our fill of that, we continued our hike. But I'll tell you, we got plenty tired. Junior, he was the first one to complain and suggested that we take a rest. Well, we didn't have any objection to that. Little did we know what this was going to lead up to. The deuce. What? What? At what? Those woods. I see them. What about them? Has anybody told you about Foxhead's woods? No. Well, some people claim they're haunted and I can't be crossed. Haunted? Yeah, you'd never find me going in them woods at night. You're scared. It's getting dark. I'd go through them woods for a shortcut home. Hey, don't scare me. Yeah, I'll bet. Leave it to old wise-cracking Mike to challenge Deuce's daring. But Deuce, in his own special way, had a way of setting him straight. A little later on, Jerry come up over the hill and wanted to know what time it was. Hey, Deuce, what time is it? Deuce checked his watch, seeing it was about 5.30, said we'd all rest for about another hour and head for home. Okay. Look like that's me. Hey there, boys. Better get up. It's getting dark. Oh, what? Oh, my gosh. Deuce, get up. It's dark. Hey, buddy. Hey, you guys, get up. It's getting dark. I'll never forget the stranger's reply when Deuce, late for a date with Tippy that evening, said he was going to shortcut through Foxhead's woods and save time. That would be the shortest way, daytime, or any other time. Believe me, lad, I know Foxhead's woods. You know, you never went night. Look, mister, no one's going to call me yellow. Nobody's calling you yellow, young man, but believe me, you'll be sorry if you trespass into those woods. I'd take the long way if I were you. You better listen to him, Deuce. Don't do it. I'll take my chances. Adios, guys. Come back, come back. You'll never escape from the screams. What screams? Screams in the night. Screams in the night? You're a lonely guy. You can't escape them. They're falling all over your garments. They're falling everywhere. You'll never make it. Come back, come back. It's hard to leave. Let me tell you, that stranger's last remark sent chills up and down my spine. But Deuce continued onward, unaffected, determined to go through with his plan. Little did he realize what awaited him.
Hey, Deuce, what, what the heck are you doing? Deuce, hey, snap out of it. What's going on, man? I must have been having a nightmare. Boy, dude, that nightmare must have been over me. <laughs> yeah, I'll say. The way you were kicking and yelling. Come on, tell us about it. Well, I had to tell the guys all about it. I was thinking about what it is, so I gave you well. I thought it was a real experience. It sure seemed like a real thing at the time. Then those woods aren't really haunted, are they? Well, I don't know. But one of these days, I'm going to explore those woods. But you can bet it's not going to be at night. I sure would like to see them. You would? How about Sunday, about 2 o'clock? That's fine with me, dude. Okay, then I'll be by to pick you up. And we'll drive out there. Well, it's promised he took her out to show her the woods. It was early afternoon when they arrived, making the trip in Tippy's car this time. She asked him to point out the woods. Realizing it was not a very good view, he told her where they could get a much better look. A little while later, they turned on to Highway 13 and arrived at just the right spot. There they are, Tippy. Fox Hedge Wood. It sure looks like a dreary forest. Maybe they are haunted. Who knows? They just might be. Yep. One of these days I'll explore those woods. I've got to find out. Tell you, I'm very, very scary. Ooh, I'm scared. That was Screams in the Night, one of our three films by the Zaleski brothers, of which three of them are here with us on our Zaleski Brothers Film Festival. And uh, that film was made when? 1948? That, that was made in 1948, right. Okay. Same year that Under the Sun was made. And uh, as, while we were watching the film, uh, we had a chance to talk, uh, Al, that this was kind of uh, pretty much what kids did in those days. Instead of maybe going down to McDonald's or wherever, uh, they went out to the countryside and just uh, roamed around. Very true. <clears throat> as you watch in, uh, uh, as you just uh, viewed in uh, Screams in the Night, you took walks into the woods. We knew where the best apple trees were, and uh, we knew where the swimming holes were. And uh, like you saw him jump off into the uh, water, well, that's exactly that the activities. You, in other words, we the kids made their own uh, uh, fun or uh, you know uh, to pass this thing. They did their own thing to pass the time away. Instead of going somewhere or listening to music or confining themselves to a certain location, we searched for adventure. Well, I'd, I'd say one word: we looked for adventure, and that's what uh, what that took us to the country and to the horses and to the, all the other activities. Len, Ed, mm -hmm. you pretty much, uh, in, it sounds, seems like you're in agreement with uh, your brother. Mm -hmm. uh, that's right. right. It mm -hmm. wasn't so much organized sports. Right. He simply did what he liked yeah. to do, went out looking for something well, to do. It was our pastime, you know. It's all, I sort of just lived and breathed and, <laughs> and thought about uh, what film are we going to make next after this one's done. And, you know, and uh, just one followed the other. We made several real short films that may maybe only lasted uh, two three minutes you know to we called them screen tests to give certain uh neighborhood chums a chance to see themselves in a film we whipped those up in usually one sunday afternoon but now in 13 films though i noticed you were talking earlier that we never saw any of the zaleski sisters <laughs> that is right we had uh, two sisters sophie and jenny but to save me, I could not find a way to fit them into any of our action epics. <laughs> However, when we did make Screams in the Night, I needed somebody that was younger, and my my two sisters would have never, you know, fit the role. Uh, well, so so you had, uh, Eleanor played the part of uh, Tippy, as we saw right. at the end. And Eleanor was a, a high school senior at uh, Lincoln High School in Canton, Ohio, where I happened to be going, and I asked her one one day if she'd 
you know, like to play this role. And of course, she jumped right on the bandwagon and did a real fine job for us. Now, after you saw, as after you finished a few of these movies, I understand you started to get letters from people who wanted to be in some of your films. Oh yes, uh, the girls at the high school were were besieging me, you know, to cast them in a role. We also got. Uh, we, after the write-up in the paper, we got some letters from people wanting to know if uh, they needed, if they, uh, you know, could be of any assistance, you know, in any way. And, and what about uh, Ralston Purina? Yes, <laughs> that was really something. The Ralston Purina Company actually wrote us a letter uh, during the time television was just coming into the scene and asked us to, uh, if we were interested in producing about 24 30-minute westerns for him and of course it, we just about <laughs> felt you know we were flabbergasted because we we in no way were set up to do you know professional type productions we we did these films on a shoestring and i mean a shoestring literally we we invested no money except for film and processing and that was it I mean, we just gathered our our uh, our relatives and friends, and and uh, we got all the cooperation we needed. Well, without further ado, we want to go to our third film because our time is short. Uh, I have to say, though, that from what I've seen, these films are a far cry from Heaven's Gate. That's for sure. Uh, way way under budget. Uh, that you were able to bring the film in under budget every time. Right. And this next film, Bold Badman, was. Uh, was our finest epic, and we actually uh, ended our filming uh, thing with this. You know, uh, that was the last film we really produced, and uh, it starred Julius Gleba, a friend who lived down the street. And he was always available. He's the one that played in Screams in the Night, and he did a fine job as uh, a desperado gambler named. Larch Garrison. And from 1949, here we have our final film in our three-part series here of the Zaleski Brothers Film Festival. This is Bold Bad Men. <laughs> Hey, Trev? Yeah, Larch, but it's a good thing we know this country. How much you think we got? 
Let's go find out. Let's see what the tally is. <laughs> we sure did, Larch. Hey, where are we heading for next? Yeah, what do you say we head down toward New Orleans? Got a couple of details waiting for me down there. Sounds good to me. Hey, suppose that sheriff picks up our trail. He won't. Let's hope. All right, split the stake. Yeah. Fifteen thousand? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand apiece ain't bad, eh, Trek? Yeah, not bad, Larch, but not like that last off in Abilene, huh? We can't do that good every time, can we? What do we do now, Larch? Head on or stay here tonight? What do you think? Yeah, we'll stay. You think it's safe? Sure. All right, let's unsaddle the horses. Yeah, we'll just rest here for the night.
What do you think, Sheriff? They've been here, all right. Let's move on, Johnny. Right. Larkin. He'll be coming through in about an hour. Gotcha. Here's your 500. You get another 500 when the job's complete. Do a good job. Yes, sir, Mr. Garrison. Start talking. I was hired to do it. By who? A man named Larch. Why, that dirty. Which way did he go? Alice. Thanks.
know, it took me some time to find you, Larch. I didn't like the way you ran away with my share of that bank loot, especially that attempt you made to get me put out of the way. You're nothing but a low-down, double-crossing coyote. And there's only one way to deal with your kind, Larch. The bullets. Wait a minute, Trek. I'll make a deal with you. I know where we can get our hands on $50,000 worth of gold. And you have all of it. How's that sound? No deal, Larch. You're gonna get just what you deserve. I'll take that gun. <laughs>
produced over a five-month period of 1949. That was the Zaleski Brothers feature, Bold Bad Men, our final feature in tonight's Zaleski Brothers Film Festival. Gentlemen, our time is short. Any closing comments you'd like to give to us about your illustrious film career? Let's start with uh, you, Al. Well, it started out, uh, of course, I was a lifelong horseman, but it started out as a living out of uh, a fantasy and an adventure. And uh, over the years, it became a permanent part of my life and a permanent part of uh, my family's life and so forth. It, uh, uh, it's never uh, uh, devaluated or uh, the interest never subsided. It just increased as the years went by. I noticed that while, enjoy it. I noticed, excuse me, I noticed while we were watching the films that uh, your interest was probably just as strong mm -hmm. as it ever was. Mm -hmm. True. That's, that's what I was referring to. It's just never, uh, you never lose it once it's, uh, once Every, it's done. Every kid wants to be a cowboy, right? Correct. Okay. Right. Ed, how about uh, you? Another thing about having made these films after you grow up and have your own children, it's a great feeling to be able to say to your kids, look, I did some acting myself. Here you are. You can mm -hmm. see what I was like when I was just a young boy. Mm -hmm. And it's a thrill to see them every so often. We usually show them at Christmas and so forth. And uh, Len, uh, I, we were talking about uh, the kind of the executive producer of uh, these films. Right, I sort of uh, <clears throat> was the production coordinator and I directed each film, but I certainly want to pay tribute to my brother Kai, who was chief cinematographer and he was the one that originally invested in the movie camera. He bought the film, he paid for the processing, he bought the editor, which allowed me to, to complete the work. And I want to pay, uh, pay tribute and uh, a special word of thanks to many friends in, uh, that lived in the neighborhood that were eager to help us, that offered their support while we were on lo location on Sundays and, and uh, late afternoons during the week. And also, I want to say thanks, Mom, Mama <laughs> Zaleski, because she put up with all our shenanigans from day to day, week to week, for four to five years, and never complained. Yeah? Well, mothers are like that, aren't they? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's, uh, it's been a real delight to have you here some 40 years after the fact. And uh, <laughs> we want to thank each of you Zaleskis and the ones that couldn't be here uh, for being here. Uh, this evening, and thank you for joining us on our Zaleski Brothers Film Festival. My name is David Fry for Warner Cable. Thank you for joining us.
deserves a spot, Dan. Where till I get a rock? This calls for a celebration. Thanks for on me at the Red Dog Saloon.
Yeah, Larch, but it's a good thing we know this territory. How much do you think we got? Let's go find out. Let's see what the tally is. <laughs> <laughs> we sure did, Larch. Hey, where are we heading for next? Yeah, what do you say we head down toward New Orleans? Got a couple cute gals wait for me down there. Sounds good to me. Hey, suppose that sheriff picks up our trail. He won't. Let's hope. All right, split the stake. Yeah. Fifteen thousand? Twenty thousand. Twenty thousand apiece ain't bad, eh, Trek? Yeah, not bad, Lars, but not like that last all in Abilene, huh? We can't do that good every time, can we? What do we do now, Lars? Head on or stay here tonight? What do you think? Yeah, we'll stay. You think it's safe? Sure. All right, let's unsaddle the horses. Yeah, we'll just rest here for tonight.
I lost him. What do you think, Sheriff? They've been here all right. Let's move on, Johnny. Right. Larkin. He'll be coming through in about an hour. Gotcha. Here's your 500. You get another 500 when the job's complete. Do a good job. Yes, sir, Mr. Garrison. Start talking. I was hired to do it. By who? A man named Larch. Why, that dirty. Which way'd he go? Alice. Thanks.
You know, it took me some time to find you, Larch. I didn't like the way you ran away with my share of that bank loot, and especially that attempt you made to get me put out of the way. You're nothing but a low-down, double-crossing coyote. And there's only one way to deal with your kind, Larch. And the bullets. Wait a minute, Trek. I'll make a deal with you. I know where we can get our hands on $50,000 worth of gold. And you have all of it. How's that sound? No deal, Larch. You're gonna get just what you deserve. I'll take that gun. <laughs> Sure. Come on, let's get outside. It's Lander. Good. We'll get him when he passes the laws.
stop a drink. Tell me who he is. Ah, here now, let's see. Why, this looks like a map. Hey, Kurt, looky there. Looks to me like he's found something, Bart. Yeah, let's keep an eye on him, see what he does next. This is a map to a gold mine. Maybe he has some of the gold on him. Joke, Bart. So, it's the old school's place, huh, Kurt? You cut me out and get it all. 
Pass out your gun. Give me the map. I might have known. Come on, make it snappy. Thank <laughs> you.